Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded on Gay Omago land by me, Liam Miller, he, him, his, a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. Uh, Love, Rinse, Repeat is supported by Uniting Mission and Education, part of the Synod here in New South Wales and ACT, and I'm thankful for their support. My guest today, she's back on the podcast, a wonderful favourite of our all, of all of us, uh, Grace G. Sun Kim. Welcome, Grace. Oh, thank you. I didn't know I was a favorite, but it's so wonderful to be a favorite of oh. some group. So <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. And I must begin by saying congratulations to you uh, for getting into a PhD program. That's oh, amazing. You. Yes. you know what? It's it's hard to do uh, a PhD, but with two kids, you got two kids now. I'm like, yeah. oh, I have to be praying for you every day. <laughs> Thank but you, that's great. I'm so oh. glad that you uh, applied and you got in. This is so exciting. So I'm just looking forward to all the exciting things that will be coming from your PhD program and after when you graduate. Oh. So congratulations. Thank you. That's that's so sweet and kind of you. Um, <laughs> well, you're definitely one of our favorites. And and uh, so for those who don't know, uh, Grace teaches theology at Earlham School of Religion, and she is the author of a whole lot of books, uh, including okay, Embracing the Other, the whole, um, the co-authored Healing Our Broken Humanity, uh, the, you know, a whole bunch of edited volumes, a recently released book, a Reimagining Spirit. And then today, today we are talking about a book that came out right at the end of last year, Hope in Disarray. But before we get to all your books and hope and disarray there, oh right there. i have an i have an e version so i can't hold it up okay so yeah sad. that's okay yeah, <laughs> i love to okay. be able to do my hold up the book move, but people know that's my move yeah. um but i want to before we get to the books you're now a podcaster uh-huh. you know a multiple oh, time right. guest of podcasts you are now hosting <laughs> the podcast madang so so i want to know a little about the podcast but also how have how have you found the process of flipping roles right of, of getting into oh. the host seat um and getting to like you know quiz other people you know what thank you for asking i was going to tell you to ask me and then i forgot so i'm so glad you can read my mind um you know i've been on your podcast several times and then i've been on trips Mm. podcasts several times and then a million other other podcasts and everybody makes it so easy especially you and trip you guys (laughs) make it so easy so i thought you know a couple years ago i said I'm just going to start my own because Mm. I'm on so many other people's podcasts. (laughs) And then I said, I'm going to just start my own. And then I got busy. Mm -hmm. And then last September, I said, okay, now I'm going to do it. Mm. It's like, I don't know. I just got up one morning and I said, I'm going to do it. And then I asked Diana Butler boss. I said, can you be my first guest? She said, sure. And then I got actually really ill. So I got Mm. ill in October and I was hospitalized and I had come up with a name for the podcast, but I can't remember what it was. I know I had come up with a name because I Googled it to make sure that no one, but then because I got ill, I kind of forgot what it was. And then I got a little better in January and February. So right at the end of February, I said, I'm going to do this. And then I just asked Diana, I said, can you do it? And she said, Mm. yeah. So within days, I had to come up with a name. (laughs) And then then I thought, I don't know how to do this. I don't know why I asked her again. I said, I don't I have no concept of a platform of where you put the podcast. So like three days, nightmare. And I had to come up with a name. And then I came up with Madang, which is a Korean word. And I am so glad. I, I, it was like a stroke of genius for me because I asked my family and my boys are like, whatever, they're not interested. But my daughter's like, this is excellent. It's excellent in the sense that, you know, as a Korean American theologian, I use a lot of Korean imagery, stuff from Korean culture. And so this understanding of Madang, it's in the traditional homes, and we have still a lot of traditional homes in Korea. Every, every home has a gate and it's usually, it's usually a metal gate and there's a wall or some stone wall or a wall around the house. So every house is like that. The homes are really small. So once you open up the gate, there is a little dirt area. So um, it's, it was hard for Koreans to have grass and keep it. So it's usually dirt. And then there might be a low table there where people sat around and ate and, and had talk, you know, nighttime talks or daytime, you know, people just sat around there. And then the rooms would 
would be coming out from the madang. So it was a weird shaped homes, maybe an L shaped or U shaped. And then the rooms would just come, people entered from the madang. So that was such an important mm. place for people to gather to, to share how their day went or share their sorrows or happiness. So I thought this is exactly the imagery that I wanted for my madang. I want my guests to come. I want my listeners and the viewers mm -hmm. to come and listen and, and just be part of the conversation as mm -hmm. if we were right there um, in their living room or that they were with me in my madang. So mm -hmm. that's how I started it. But, you know, once I started, I realized how much work <laughs> is involved i had what? like i said you know you make it so easy and then I, it's so much work for me and i'm not very good with technology so it's it's hard and i think people like you because you guys are good with technology know how to do it it just you probably don't even have to think about it you can just probably do it in your sleep but for me it's it's so much work and then but now i just released my eighth episode and I was like it's a point of no return either I'm going to go a few more and then stop or I just have to keep going right yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yes I like just, the yeah. end result but you know mm. Liam it's much like writing a book I mm. you know people think you know it's so easy to sit around and just type some words on your laptop and a book magically appears but <laughs> it's torture mm. and I feel like this podcast is torture too until it comes out and then I'm very happy with the with the result mm. and I think same with the book once the book is out like writing this was difficult but mm. once it comes out I'm just so happy with the end result so that's how it's going with my podcast okay. and I okay. I'm so excited to be part of your kind of community hey. now hey one of us <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've just joined a club, <laughs> although it's a very difficult club. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so much work for me. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. And yes, yeah, um, I think you're, you're, this will come out soon. So your, your most recent episode was with um, Melissa Flora Bixler, another friend of the podcast. So um, people should definitely go check that out. Um, yeah. So so let's talk about the, that most recent, that, that other form of torture of, of hope and disarray. <laughs> um, so this is a, uh, it's, it, it, and I think you should be very proud of what you've got, what is now out there. Oh, it's, thank it's a great you. Book. You're so nice to me. Oh. That's why I, want, I love coming on your podcast. <laughs> I'm you always lift me. And... <laughs> I know you lift up my spirit. So thank you. I needed yeah. that today. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're welcome. So um, I guess just give us the brief, you know, this is a book written for, you know, um, you know, just anyone who, who who wants to read a book, right? It's 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 yeah. um mm -hmm. it's got questions in it to be, you know, so it could be used in group settings. It's kind of somewhat, though, though more than this, build something around the liturgical year. So it can be used as kind of a a long-term devotional or kind of it can be just read through good series of essays to get us thinking about hope. So talk to us a bit about where how you started to wrestle with this idea that this is what you want to work on. And uh in yes, yeah, maybe your hopes for it for those who decide to pick it up. Yeah, so I, you know, I at the beginning of my teaching career, it was very important to write academic books. So I was very focused and had to make sure it's academic and, um, you know, it's going to be in the seminary libraries. That was a priority for me. But now as I age, <laughs> getting older and older, <laughs> and I've written the academic books, I feel like now I should just write for the public. Mm. You know, not all my books are going to be for the public, but this particular book, Hope and Disarray, is especially for the public. And it can be, um, you know, it is very Christian, but it, you know, I, I hope non-Christians will read it, um, other people of other faith will read it, because the content is for all people. Mm. So there's 28 um, short reflections. And, you know, some of them were written just because it helps me mm. work out my own problems. So, you know, the, the problems that I face of sexism and discrimination and racism, mm. um, you know, I visited Australia and I felt you know, I wasn't there long, maybe two or three weeks. I felt like everybody is so kind and so nice. Everybody's like happy to see you on the street. And so it was like so wonderful to visit Australia. But here I'm always a little cautious because, uh, you know, one thing, people do carry guns. You just don't know. And another thing, there is so much discrimination 
here, you know, where immigrants have come to the United States to seek a new life and there is so much hardship. So to work through some of this, I've written these pieces because I feel like it it, it's not just me that faced these difficulties. I know other women will face these difficulties. I know other immigrants and people of color. And then it, I also tackle climate change and climate mm. injustice. And that is something that everyone, mm. you know, it doesn't matter, you know, what ethnicity you belong to, what class you belong to, which country you live in. It's such an important topic. It's one of the most important topics of our time. You know, if we don't change our ways of living, we are not going to destroy this planet. Mm. So I, I have pieces on that too. So I write and I'm hoping that as you mentioned, people will use it as a devotional book or just easy reading book because it's not very technical. Um, it's just very reflective and people can use it in church groups or any small groups because it is laid out to have a discussion. So it begins with a scripture passage and then, you know, a short reflection on the scripture passage. I think usually they're two or four pages long and then it ends with questions so that people can ask questions to themselves or within the group so it is nicely set out and as you mentioned you know i do have some liturgical calendar year material that people can use to reflect so i'm really hoping that people um, who are seeking either christianity or a faith or are just spiritual or just are concerned with some of these social justice issues will pick mm. up the book and just read it it's very easy reading and i think you know, you can start in the morning and maybe end the next day, <laughs> night, <Yes. laughs> or even yeah. in one day if you're a fast reader. Yeah, because yeah. it's easy reading and it and I but I'm hoping people don't rush through it, but mm. take the time to reflect and and think about how they can change. You know, our life is such that we should become, you know, scripture says we should be new creatures every day. And I'm hoping that books like mine and other books out there that will challenge people, will challenge people to live a better life and, and, and be more kind and be more loving and take care of each other and creation and community. Thank you for that. And I think like um, definitely those chapters on or the, the reflections on, you know, on, on, on racism and on the migrant experience and sexism will certainly, you know, resonate here. Um, folks will feel that too. Um, I'm curious about, so, so hope in disarray. Now I know you, Grayson, people who've listened to this interview will know you as quite a joyful person. Uh, uh, um, but I'm curious, does hope come easy to you? Uh, or, or is this, is, is hope something that you, really <laughs> comes and goes waxes and wanes you have to really hold on to with a firm grip and so and is that where the book emerges from or is it something that you know you experience more easily and so i hoping to um show others how <laughs> yeah you know i think um you know social media um these days you know you just present yourself in the best possible way so you may take five six pictures and then you post the best one to present how wonderful you are mm. or how wonderful your life is so <laughs> i think um, many of us do that and so even on a podcast i'm just always excited to be on a podcast and excited to see you so of course i'm happy and joyful <laughs> and i wish we could just do this in person like we did with um healing our broken humanity mm. and maybe one day we'll do it together uh face to face so it is um you know i'm very happy so mm -hmm. in in all my podcasts i'm very excited and i'm joyful but i think in our day to day mm. you know i i i'm you know most of my life and i know um we talked earlier and i'll be back to do my next book invisible which mm. will be coming out in the fall and I think I shared too much of my life in there. I've just finished the copy editing and I thought, oh, you know, I, I don't know if I should have written all this stuff, but it was like a point of no return because it kind of fit the book and I just can't take bulk material out at this stage. I could have done it before I submitted. So now it's going to be out there. And so it's not an easy life. I think, um, you know, as women of color here in the US, there's barriers 
mm. I face all the time um, uh, in the academy, in the church, in community, um, even in my own Korean American community. There's you know sexism and patriarchy. Mm. There's all this structure that I have to face and fight all the time, and you know right now. You know we're in the we're in a pandemic, and you know there's so much Asian hate, particularly here in the U.S. and also in Canada. So this is happening to my community, and the trauma is real. You know my my second uh, Madang podcast ep, uh, interview was with uh, Russell Jung, who is co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate. And you know, like you, I post my videos too. And you know, every time I look at that video, I just cringe because you see the because I interviewed him. Um, I think March twentieth, and the hate crime, the killing happened March sixteen here in the U.S., where a young white man went uh, to three spas and shot at people and ended up killing eight. Six were of Asian American or API descent. Um, heritage. So the trauma is real and it and it traumatizes your body and it stays in your body. So if you look at my video, uh, you know, I started with Diana Butler Bass, Bass and I was very joyful. I was so excited because she was my first one and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So <laughs> I, I just went with it. And then I, the second one was with Russell Jung and you can see uh, the trauma on my face and I didn't know it then I, I knew I was traumatized because you see, as Asian Americans, we are visible. If I walk down the street, people can see me. You know, some, some parts of your identity, you can hide in certain ways. Your education, you can hide. Uh, maybe uh, your sexuality, you can hide. There's different identities, but my racialized identity, people, down the street can see that I'm Asian American. So it's, we can, mm. I can be targeted mm. at any time. Mm. My kids, my family can be targeted anytime. So that's the trauma. And so, and then the next episode was with Russell, I mean, with Miguel de la Torre and, and all the other ones, you see my normal face, but for, with Russell Jung, I was so traumatized because I really wanted him. It was a special edition because of this hate crime that happened here in the US. And because he is the co-founder of this organization, which is um, collecting how much hate crime there is, you know, he started this in March, 2020, um, last year. And I think from over a year, you know, over 4,000 hate crimes mm -hmm. that were um, reported. And some of them are murder, some of them are verbal, and, and some of them are physical. But, you know, we Asian Americans live with this honor shame system, and some of us are so shameful that we will not report. So I'm sure the number is way higher than the 4,000. So this is a difficulty that I face all the time. So, you know, for a short while on a podcast, I could be all cheerful and happy. But on a day to day basis, it's really difficult. So that's why I write these pieces, because, you know, Asian Asians worldwide, we're 60% of the world population, but here in the US, we're 6%. We're a very small minority, but we're visible. We're very grow we're a fast growing uh, visible minority here in the United States. And you know, we're gonna maybe outgrow some of the other uh, racialized groups. And I know it's not just me that feel this difficulty. So many people experience this difficulty. Right after that, March 16, I spoke to um, the Asian American st uh, student group at Gordon College, uh, and they were traumatized. You know, mm -hmm. students, my, my daughter, who was a student at Cornell, you know, she couldn't function for weeks. And, you know, it was good that her professors actually reached out to many of the Asian American students and said, if you need extensions, if you need um, mm -hmm. whatever help, we are here. Mm -hmm. So I think this awareness and so it is a very difficult mm -hmm. world. You know, you interviewed me and Graham about healing a broken humanity. The humanity, you know, it is broken in so many places. And so, you know, you 
um, as an ordained minister, you're always there trying to help and, and you are always in solidarity with people of color and with other groups, marginalized groups. And that's why I'm always thankful to you, you know, Liam, because you, you know, we need people like you to stand in solidarity because it's so hard to fight racism, discrimination, marginalization, sexism. So, you know, I am always thankful to white men like you and Graham who stay in solidarity with us and, and fight with us. So, and we need more of you. So thank you for your ministry. You know, it, you have so many different ministries, but this podcast is one of them. And I'm grateful for how you invite uh, guests, uh, people of color to your, to your podcast and to, and women, because not all podcasts do that. You know, they're very exclusive, <laughs> you know, they like their white, boys club so i'm just yeah. grateful for you to always reach out and invite people like me and other people of color and you know then you are able to amplify our voices that need to be heard because i think people just don't understand um what we face daily and so you know that's why i kind of work it out you know, and I don't touch every issue but mm -hmm. I try to touch some issues that have affected me in this particular book. And I'm hoping that, you know, whether you're white or black, Asian American, Hispanic, uh, natives, aboriginals, that it will still uh, resonate and that we can be this one body of Christ working together to share the good news and to work for justice. Mm. Thank you, Grace. I think that's so important. And that's, I mean, that's such a great endorsement for the book, right? This is a book about hope that's, you know, not in any way ever going to set off like a cheap optimism, right? That That, that is going yeah. to wrestle with just, just how dire the situation is, you know, how, how, how ugly and broken the world and humanity can be and yet, you know, won't relinquish hope uh, and, and will hold on um, to that. While we're kind of talking about the, I guess some of this, you know, the this pain and this, more violent disarray that that you know you're, you're trying to speak hope into or speak from about hope um you you know we're now in a time where theology has been written uh, post the me too era post church sex abuse scandals child abuse scandals like that's just like like that's like the witness of the church you know is is very much like having you know totally impacted by that and, and theology needs to like you know reckon with this you know, essentially a new epoch a new era in what um in how we're thinking about this whole topic and so you have a couple of chapters that that address this that address you have one about removing the shame of sexual harassment uh, we have a few others as well um and so i'm curious about like you know looking for hope or trying to write about Christian hope in this time in the, with this um, context around us. So yeah, just curious about that a bit. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are a few theologians who say, you know, we shouldn't live with hope, but I'm one of those um, that need to cling to hope. As I shared yeah. earlier about uh, these um, injustices that we face. And so, you know, when I think about the early Christians, the early Christians, um, you know, when they faced persecution and they wanted to share with one another that they were Christians, they had, they used two symbols. One of them is a symbol of the fish. And then the other one is a symbol of the anchor. And so even in scripture, it says, you know, the hope gives us anchor, you know, Christ is our anchor. And so, you know, when the storms come and go, you know, either we're going to be pushed out and we can drown, or we need to be anchored in something. And so, and I know, those who are so hopeless may do something drastic. You know, I've at times, and people who struggle with mental health issues or any physical issues or any, you know, discriminate, whatever issues people face, they may get pushed over to the point that they want to give up. So I think when the storms come, we need to be anchored in something. And that's, you know, I use that Im imagery here in the book yeah. that the hope becomes this anchor in our lives. When we cannot 
find anything else to hold on to. We hold on to the hope that Christ gives to us. And I think as Christians, I think that is real good news. You know, in, in light of all these difficulties, you know, with climate injustice that's happening, you know, here in the U.S., the climate is going crazy. Mm. You know, one day hot, one day cold, and this is our summer, and mm. I, this is not normal. And the weathers are more extreme. The, the storms are more dangerous. It, it does kill people. Mm. You know, either the winter storms or the hurricanes, you know, it's getting drastic. And these are all part of the climate and just the climate change that's happening. So, you know, we are facing these issues. Either we're going to give up and say, I'm not going to do anything about mm. it, or we're going to live in hope. And, mm. you know, as you mentioned before, um, you said, you know, hope is not this optimism. So it's not just this oh, warm, fuzzy feeling of being all optimistic. It is um, this inner peace that we find in Christ. And also this hope drives us to work for some social justice. So the issues that I deal with in the book, you know, racism or discrimination, climate injustice, we don't just sit, sit around and say, okay, that's it. We who live in hope want to be changed. And that hope pushes us to work for some social justice. And that's very important equation of this understanding of hope. So um, I, my wish is that the readers will be challenged to make changes. If they're a lawyer to make help make changes in law, you know, if, if they work in some different industry that they will work for equality. And it, there's so many things that we can all work for and work towards to make it a better uh, place for all of us to live. And it's not just human beings, it's all of God's creation. Mm. You know, we need to take care of all of God's creation. So that is my wish for the book when people read it and pick it up and use it for themselves or as a study. Mm. Thank you, Grace. Um, it, was, it was interesting, I was reading the in the introduction you write, you have this um, great line, which kind of building off that anchor idea that we just talked about that, figure out what to hope for. This is the least we can do in our lives. The most we can do is live inside it, to reside forever within our hope, to take our final breath and find assurance in not knowing if such hope was fulfilled, but that it was the hope itself that fulfilled us each working day, which I think is very uh, incredibly beautiful. And it, it, it kind of brought to mind like that, um, is that classic uh, like Socrates, like, you know, um, the unexamined life is not worth living. Ooh. And I much prefer <laughs> yeah. your one that like, the, <laughs> the, the, in a similar sort of way that like, look, you know, the, what is worth examining is what we have hope in, right? To find that, mm -hmm. find that thing and then live inside it and let it draw you to action and all that. And, and yet not, and it's, it's hope because we don't know it's things unseen, right? It's, we don't know exactly yeah. that this hope mm -hmm. is going to be, if, if we knew exactly that it was, then it wouldn't be hope. It's just expectation. Um, uh -huh. but there's this hope that but, but we live into it and let it shape us. And, and you, you write another point, let that hope actually become us. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's part of where this book kind of points to, as you said, hoping that folks from other faiths or no faith could read this too, because, you know, at, at a heart, and you be, you, I think you did the very, um, Peter thing of be ready to give an account for the hope that is within you, but for, but, but there's also this broader call to to hope, right? And to think yeah. about where you put that anchor, and is it something that actually gives you hope and leads you to justice and leads you into relationship, or is it something else? And then you might want to re-examine that. Um, and I think that's just a really beautiful thing of, of the way letting hope shape your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you about that. I, and maybe you can make a little meme about that too. So I think that's great how you brought in Socrates. I'm like, wow, I'm being compared to Socrates. Uh, you just lifted up my spirit. Uh, but you know, I think, you know, the the difficulties I face as a woman of color, as an immigrant woman, mm. you know, I, I arrived in Canada at the age of five, I couldn't speak English. I, I never learned English when I was a kid in Korea. So I started kindergarten, didn't know anything and the discrimination, the racism, you know, what I have uh, faced throughout so much of my life and it doesn't end because even as a woman of color scholar you know there's a lot of barriers for us it's not easy yeah. um people still you know 
think mm -hmm. what we're doing is not legitimate. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what white men are doing is the real thing. And what we're doing is not the real thing. So, you know, there's difficulties everywhere. And yes. so every day when I face these things, and then when I had the health problem too, mm -hmm. and I continue, mm -hmm. I really live in this hope. And I think, you know, that is, you know, Christ gives us this hope. And so for me, it's like, it's this whole kind of package and you can't kind of separate it. You know, I, I write so much about the spirit and hopefully one day, maybe I'll be coming back to talk about reimagining spirit. You know, the spirit is all within you know, we are in the spirit and the spirit is in us. And I feel that's the same with hope. You can't really separate. And I think in this dualistic world, especially in, in North America, like the Western world, it, we tend to separate things so clearly and because it, then it helps us understand better. But in the Eastern mind, things are not so clearly separated. There's always a both and, and, and things are like, mesh together and that's how I kind of approach Christianity it's not so separate you know the spirit the German theologians kind of it was a very philosophical way of understanding spirit it was something out there oh. felt it kind of separated but to me it's like this whole thing for I cannot separate all that with faith from faith or love or peace. It's like all meshed together. I think it's very important for us to kind of recognize this. And so we live in this hope. It's this hope that really anchors us and really gives us life. It, it gives us this energy to work for justice and to move towards you know, social justice. Mm. So I'm hoping I'm making sense. It, you Absolutely. know, everything makes sense Absolutely. in my mind, but I'm, <laughs> I teach, I'm like, I don't know if the students understood what I was saying, because everything is clear in my head, but I don't know if it's clear out when it comes out of my mouth. <laughs> it's very clear. And no, no, it is, it is. And it's clear in the book. Um, okay. and, and, uh, and, and people really should pick up the book. Um, I was thinking, you know, as, as you said, there's so many different ways to read it. Like as you said, there's 28 reflections about two to four pages each, you know, you could read one a day. That's a month. Um, and that's a good month well spent. You've given some space to, to think about each reflection as you go through your day. Um, I think that's, that would be not a bad way to, to think about doing it at all. Uh, I was actually going to, uh, as, as we kind of move toward a close or, or read this one little, uh, moment from your conclusion, which I think was so beautiful, uh, which is call out for love, call out for peace, call out for light, call out for mercy, call out for God, reach out, not for the purpose of gaining something in return, but because the call itself is the gift. The admission that professed desire you seek is not about the reception of certainty, but about the reaffirmation of hope. And I think that's quite wonderful. Uh, so the book is Hope in Disarray. Folks should get oh, that, pick it up so now. Much. The podcast yeah. is Madang. Mm -hmm. People should subscribe. If you're yeah. already listening to this, you know how to listen to a podcast. So go and <laughs> <laughs> figure that out. Um, and yes, and as yeah. you mentioned, you're going to be back I, in the... I must add that the podcast... Yes. It, yeah. Oh, no. And I just yeah. wanted to say that the podcast is now hosted by Christian Century. So I don't know right. if Australians get Christian Century, but it's a big yeah. uh, magazine here in the US. So it's hosted by Christian Century. And I must also thank uh, Mitri uh, Rahab, who wrote the foreword, and then Elizabeth Henson Hasty, who wrote the afterward. So I'm very mm. thankful for them um, to have contributed to my book. So thank yeah. you. No, Sorry great. to interrupt you. No, no, that was good. That was important to, to mention. Um, and we're, we're going to have you back on a bit later in the year. Folks, keep your eye out for Invisible, um, Grace's next coming book, which I think has been released in November, but pre-orders will start before that. Um, and I think we're very excited for, for, for that book and, and for what comes next. Uh, is it, uh, anything else you want to draw our attention to at this moment? Um. Actually, the book is available to pre-order, oh, so great. wherever books are sold online or in, yeah, so, yeah, so it's already available for pre-order, so people can order Invisible, and I love the new cover on that one. Yes. People say that's my best cover yet, so we'll see. Hey, we'll see what go. people say, but that's what. <laughs>
Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Liam, for having me on. And I hope you can still. When you visit me, so, but I hope you can have me back and continue your podcast. Oh, thank you. So you broke up a tiny bit in that answer, but I think you were saying, I hope the podcast continues. Did we break up? Did we break just, up? Just a tiny bit, but. Um, yeah, let me just say it again. Yeah. Okay, let me just. I uh, hope that um, when you start your PhD program, you're going to be very busy and you have two kids at home. So I hope that you continue to have your podcast and invite me back because, you know, your podcast is so important and I've really appreciated all your podcasts. And, you know, you did that special one with Easter and I think mm. that was so important. So you do these exciting things. I just, if I mind, I'm just inviting basically authors. That's good. These mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, long time again. Mm. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you always for coming on. You're always such a wonderful, uh, so so wonderful to talk with you and, and read, read your work. So thank you, Grace. And uh, yes, look forward to seeing you again soon. And thanks everyone for listening. And we'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>